these how we go ah sorry let me go back to the poll you don't have to know about anti terminator sequences i don't think anyway casein is a major protein found in mammalian milk when the mammals are producing milk the pathway for the production of casein can be represented as shown in the diagram below on the left when the mammal is not producing milk the gene can be trans represented as shown in the diagram below on the right. So which one of the following conclusions can be made from the info above? It's going to be like two minutes to answer this, I guess, and then we can go through the answer and go through the content. I'm going to get some hair clips because I need to get my hair away. Cool, so hopefully, oops, I'm wrong side. Hopefully you guys have had a go at that. I'll give you like a minute more. Mm, you guys have like four weeks until your exam. Scary. You're so active. Thank you guys for like answering the question too. So fast as well. I'll give it like one more minute and then we'll go through the answer together. Oh, we have at least 90 watches today. Watches, viewers. Um, let's reveal the question and answer. Cool, good job guys. The majority of you got that right. Um, so the hormone prolactin allows for the expression of the casein gene. So we're just going to walk through this. Um, so we can see here we've got the casein gene. We've got casein mRNA. The mRNA is just chilling here and it gets translated into the protein. Here we've got prolactin. So prolactin inactivates ribonuclease. What does ribonuclease do? We don't really know yet. But if we look at this panel, we can see that we've got the ribonuclease is active because prolactin is not working. And so ribonuclease actually digests the mRNA and chops it up. Okay, so as we can see, we've got the mRNA being digested and the casein protein being made. And so ribonuclease has the effect of turning on the casein gene because... Uh, well, that's false. Ribonuclease has the effect of turning on the casein gene. No, okay, good. I was like, why Why is that there? Um, that's not true, because ribonuclease actually digests the mRNA, so that's not true. Casein is a repressive protein for milk production. We have no idea. We've, we've not given enough information about that, really. C, the hormone prolactin allows for the expression of the casein gene. Yes, let's say so, because it inactivates the ribonuclease, thus allowing expression of that gene um, and allowing for translation. Cool. 
because without it you don't have well, you've got the mRNA being digested and so it's not really expressed properly okay let's end the poll do you have to wait poll Ooh, yeah there's so much here how do we know if the question is related to repression or attenuation so repression will have like the actual repressor it will typically talk about the repressor as in that actual protein which goes and binds to the operator region and it'll talk about things like so we've never done a whole exam on the trip operon before and so they might ask you to discuss both methods methods both methods of regulation and so you might have to be like explaining repression two points marks or whatever work there and then maybe two marks allotted to um attenuation so right now it's a bit unpredictable but if they do mention an actual operator region like what binds to the operator region you know it's a repressor and you might have to explain how the repressor works and talk about in high levels, you know, you've got tryptophan activating the repressor and as a result, repressor will bind to the operator and therefore you've got um, physical blockade of that operator and so the promoter, um, the polymerase can't bind to the promoter and transcribe. Whereas if they talk about the uh, hairpin sequence at all or they talk about the leader sequence, you know they're going to be mentioning the um, attenuation stuff. So just kind of be on top of that. And once again, like definitely go and like look up, I think it looks even worse. Look up this document. Okay, I'm just leaving that. I'm just gonna wash it. <laughs> levels of protein structure. So this is kind of a big summary table. We've know we know we've got four levels of protein structure: primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Um. So we know that some proteins can be completely like functional at the tertiary structure, whereas some might also be functional or might have to be functional only at the quaternary structure. I think here it's important to note that we use the word polypeptide interchangeably often, but they're slightly different. So polypeptide is often an inactivated protein, um, like it's not yet active. If it is active, we typically refer to it as a protein. So the primary structure is a sequence of amino acids, kind of like a necklace you know, with beads on it. The, the amino acids are the beads and they're joined by peptide bonding. Secondary structure is the localized coiling and folding, and it forms alpha helices and beta pleated sheets, as well as random coils. Make sure you write down random coils as well, because that might come up. Um, make sure you also say beta pleated sheets. You can't just say beta sheets. You have to say beta pleated. That's the VCAR approved term. Tertiary structure. So we need to know this is the 3D structure, and it's determined by its interactions between the R groups of the amino acids. So even though it's a tertiary structure, it's kind of referring to the amino acids. Each individual amino acid has different characteristics. It might be hydrophobic or polar or hydrophilic. They've all got different traits, and so they kind of govern the interactions with one another and the folding patterns in the tertiary structure. And so we've got different examples, so globular and fibrous proteins. You don't actually need to know that, um, but anyway. Quaternary structure is when you've got several polypeptide chains maybe joined together. So like a group of four of them actually gives rise to hemoglobin, which is the oxygen carrier in your blood. And so that's a quaternary protein. So it's got several polypeptides joined together. Okay, on to enzymes. So enzymes, um, what is an enzyme? It's a biological catalyst. What is a catalyst? A catalyst is something that speeds up a reaction rate by reducing the activation energy needed to initiate the reaction. So that's quite a convoluted example, but I really like you guys to know that enzymes speed up reaction rates. And so here you've got an enzyme and here you've got the substrate. The substrate will bind to the enzyme at the active site and then you've got production of products and it may break down some products or substrates into separate products or I might join them together. Enzymes are just really good. Um, let's see if there's anything else we need to cover here. Hopefully I've covered attenuation enough and otherwise go and like check out that document here. So they do have quite a bit of info on attenuation. Um, literally got quite a bit on the tripopron so I think this is pretty much all you need to know about tripopron. It's all like summarized here. Okay, now we're moving on to enzymes and um, we'll be looking at plasmids in a minute too. So, okay, I feel like my headings are wrong. Why are my headings wrong?
Then why do you so strange? Um, anyway, so enzymes. We're only at slide 23 of 123, and <laughs> we're like nearly an hour through. So endonuclease is a molecular scissors which cut DNAs at specific sequences, and they're palindromic, meaning they cut um, where the sequence is the same, spread forwards and backwards. Um, you can get either sticky ends or blunt ends. This is blunt ends, this is sticky ends, where it's got those overhanging segments. What is ligase? Molecular glue, which joins those um, nucleotides together. What are polymerases? Well, anything ending in ase is usually an enzyme. Polymer means a long chain. Therefore, polymerase is an enzyme which makes a long chained molecule. Things like DNA polymerase. Okay, onto CRISPR-Cas9. I was just doing this with my students yesterday. Um, it is a bit of a complex process. I would actually encourage you guys to take a step back and think about what CRISPR does in general and like its natural habitat. So CRISPR is naturally a bacterial defense system. It's like bacterial um, immunity. And so bacteriophages are viruses which will infect only bacteria. And so what happens is that a virus, this bacteriophage, will inject its genetic material into a bacteria. It will make the bacteria sick, poor bacteria. But also the bacteria will actually save a copy of that viral RNA or DNA and incorporate it into this thing called the CRISPR-Cas9 complex. And so it saves it as a spacer and then it will remember it in the future. And so what happens is that in the future, this bacteriophage comes back and wants to infect again. But we've actually got a copy saved of that viral RNA or DNA. And so we recognize it. And so we've got this guide sequence which recognizes it, or the spacer region, the bacteria. And we'll go, hey, I've seen this, this virus before, it's bad, let's kill it. And so we've got the Cas9, which is a endonuclease. And so it will actually chomp up that viral invader DNA or RNA and kill it and prevent it from actually harming the bacteria. That's kind of a bit of background. I know I went through that very fast. But kind of just a bit of a summary. So maybe go and read up on CRISPR a bit more, like background, because you don't need to know as much about the background of it, but I think it's really useful in understanding this complex kind of topic. And maybe come back and listen to me give that explanation again and see if you understand it. Um, oh, it looks like I don't have very much on CRISPR. Hmm. Okay, if we've got time at the end, I might come back to CRISPR. But I did put a lot of immunity in here. Um, I guess I do want to like point you in the right direction of resources. So there's a really good website. It's called yourgenome.org. Um, yourgenome.org. And they've got really good, I'll just show you actually, really good like illustrations of CRISPR. And I think it's a really good website. Um, you also want to know things like the guide RNA spacer I guess um PAM sequence make sure you know the PAM sequence so you can like look up this for here and it'll come up with some it also has a really good discussion of like ethical principles so I think that that's really good too it kind of explains things really well it has really nice pictures too which I kind of like and if we go to our document here Anything which is kind of new to the study design, they provide a bit of info here. So here they talk about CRISPR, they talk about the PAM sequence. We need to understand that the PAM sequence is important in ensuring that we are only targeting um, viral infected, or like non-native DNA or RNA. It's kind of hard to explain that with a diagram. Let me try and get a diagram. Just got wrong. So we actually use CRISPR as a genome editing technology. Um, so I'm going to spend a bit of time on this actually, and then we're going to spend time on other stuff. Um, that NGG there, that's the PAM sequence. So it's the protospacer adjacent motif. Um, here is the Cas9. So the Cas9 is this entire complex here. Here we've got the guide RNA. So it's made up of a tracer. You don't need to know too much about it. Um, CR RNA. This is pretty much just the guide RNA. So guide RNA will recognize a particular segment in our gene of interest. So say this is a fish, and you want to turn this fish into a, a fluorescent fish. 
And so you'll actually identify a particular region of genes involved in like color or whatever maybe, and you will use the guide RNA to actually be specific to it. And so it will find that sequence. It will actually find the PAM as well. So it knows where to cut because it goes, yes, there's the PAM sequence right next to it. I know where to cut. So it knows to cut next to the PAM sequence. And then you can actually have the Cas9 complex, which is the actual restriction enzyme or endonuclease, it will cut it there. And then you can have um, a further editing happening here. So like cutting it up, adding nucleotides, deleting some, anything like that. So it's really important to know that this CRISPR-Cas9, I gave you a bit of background on how it's used in bacteria. This is how we use it in the lab to modify genomes. And so we can induce a cut here um, and then modify the nucleotides. So do be aware of that. Um, go back to this document and really try and like interrogate what they're talking about here. They really emphasize photosynthetic efficiencies and increasing crop yields to kind of understand how we can use CRISPR. And then also, like on my phone, like on the news app, I'll try and show you. Um, there is, if you go to news, I have an iPhone. And if you go to like following, you can like follow a biology thing. Let me scroll. Let me see if I can find it. Where is it? Biology. Or I just follow a bunch of like nerdy biology channels. Um, where's the screen? Okay, so. Um, let me go to biology. Let me just search up biology. It's not showing my screen. Okay, and you can like favorite biology on your news app, and then it will show you tech like random STEM articles. And a lot of the time it's about CRISPR. Like people are obsessed with CRISPR and so you'll often get CRISPR articles. And so a lot of it will discuss the ethical complications associated with it and why it's maybe a bad thing or why it's a good thing or how it can affect long-term health in the future. Or even just random things like scientists have just created a purple tomato and people are kind of like apprehensive buying this tomato because it seems unusual. And it's completely like safe. It's a normal tomato, it's just purple. But people are like freaking out because it's purple and it's not natural. Um, so there is a lot of stuff about like ethical implications. Anyway, I hope that covers CRISPR kind of okay. And I hope I've provided you guys some references that you can use to kind of learn more about it. Cause we've got to keep going through content cause we're very slow here. Okay, PCR is a technique used to amplify DNA. We need several ingredients. So TAC polymerase, primers, nucleotides. There are three stages. You need to know the temperatures of each stage. You need to know the names and you need to know what occurs in each stage. So denaturation, separate the double strands of DNA into two separate ones. High temperature, because you want to break the hydrogen bonds between the double strands. Add the primer in. Primer is kind of like kick-starting the process. You want to have this kind of like a cooler temperature. Extension phase, you want to um, add free nucleotides and it will extend it further. Gel electrophoresis, this is another technique. Oh, by the way, for um, PCR, it's not written down here, but you need to know that you want to replicate or repeat this process many, many times over. Write that down. So I lost a mark on my year 11 exam because I didn't write down repeat PCR several times over and I'm still kind of salty about that. So make sure you write that down, please. Um, cool. Gel electrophoresis is a technique used to separate DNA fragments in a mixture on the basis of molecular size or weight. You've got electrodes, positive and negative. We know DNA is negatively charged. We're going to put the DNA in the wells at the top and there are little pores through this like gel really thick jelly type slab thing and the DNA will migrate through those pores to try and get to the other side the positive electrode because it's negatively charged it wants to move to the positive side and so it will separate it based on size and weight and those which are smallest are going to get there faster because they're really tiny whereas those which are larger are going to get stuck because they can't go through the pores as well and we're going to skip that because I don't think I made a question for it <laughs> um <clears throat> okay no we're not we'll just do it real quick Looking at this, we've got the victim and the crime scene samples. This is the victim's DNA, so we want to ignore all those strands. We want to find someone whose strands um, are the same as the other ones, anything remaining. So we've got that, that, that. So I'm guessing suspect two is the criminal who murdered victim two, or the victim. Suspect two is a murderer. Um, DNA profiling. So we've got short tandem repeats, which are repetitions of bases. Every person on Earth has kind of different numbers of short tandem repeats, I mean, probably. I mean, I might have like 70 short tandem repeats at one particular loci or location on my chromosomes. You might have 342, right? Usually we have different numbers. And so the probability that I have the same number as you at one particular loci is quite rare. 
the probability that I have one or like two loci where I have two of the same numbers of repetitions as you at two different locations is even rarer. And if I have like eight different loci and we're comparing with eight of your loci, it's such a touch of like tiny, tiny, tiny little chance that you and I will have the exact same numbers of repetitions of these short time repeats as each other. And this is how like the FBI like keeps a database of people, right? They take like eight separate short time repeats from different loci, eight different loci, and they kind of keep that on record. And so people are going to have different numbers unless they're identical twins or like clones. Um, but yeah, it's really unlikely. So it kind of helps with DNA profiling, like identify the father in this paternity test or who was the criminal in this crime scene, stuff like that. And so you perform PCR and you can once again use it to identify alleles and determine who the other person at the crime scene was or who like the father of this child is, stuff like that. Uh, okay, GMOs. So these are genetically modified organisms. Just any... The genes have been altered in any way. You've deleted a gene, you've moved a gene, you've added one, that's all. With transgenic though, you've actually inserted genes from another organism. And so you've got some green fluorescent jellyfish. A lot of people like insert this gene into zebrafish for studies. And so that would be a transgenic fish because it's got genes from another trans, from another organism. Um, so be aware of those definitions. This was on my exam actually in 2018. I had to like differentiate these two terms. And I would expect it would come up again. So keep that in mind. Once again, anything purple, make a flash cut out of it. Okay, we already talked a bit about enzymes and how they work, but just knowing that they can denature. Um, so if they're exposed to high temperatures or different pH levels outside the optimal range, it will actually denature. And so this is a permanent thing. It will change its bonding. And so it can no longer interact with its substrates and things. You've got two types of inhibition, competitive and non-competitive. Non-competitive is very effective because it binds at a different site. Um, you can see a competitive inhibition, it competes with the substrate to bind at the active site, whereas with non-competitive, it binds at an allosteric site. And yeah, you've got the release of the substrate. Okay, I know I'm just rushing through this part here, but I feel like a lot of the stuff, like I'm talking and it's fast, but I put all the information on the slides. So I hope you guys are okay with that. And once again, just email me if you've got questions at the end. I'll put them in the chat, like the, the Q&A thing. But I am well aware that I'm going very fast. It's just I kind of wanted to spend some time um, on immunity, really. Um, do you know the different factors in this graph? This is kind of just emphasizing that different enzymes have different optimal pH levels. And anything outside is optimal will cause it to denature. This is showing that anything above the optimal temperature will cause it to denature. Anything below the optimal temperature won't cause denaturation, but it will make it work slower. Okay. Um, let me just get back to questions. I hope I'm going at an okay pace. Okay, you need to repeat PCR many times, because if you just do it once, you've got two copies. We want to end up with like a huge amount of copies. Because usually, like, you might find some DNA at a crime scene, and it's a very small amount of DNA. It's not enough to work with, so you need to make many copies of it. And so we want to repeat the PCR many, many times. And it will increase exponentially, to throw in a methods term. I nearly failed methods, so I'm really proud of using that word. Um, but it will double each time, okay? Because if you've got one strand of DNA, you'll double it by the end of it. If you've got two strands, you'll have four, and then eight, and then you just keep doubling over and over. So it will increase exponentially. You'll end up with a ton of DNA to work with. So hopefully that is a good, oh my god, we've got 67 questions. Um, oh god, that's a lot of questions. Oh, I can tick them. Okay, cool. Let me tick the questions which I've done. Hopefully I've covered CRISPR a bit. Make sure you do go and read that doc. Pretty much anything you need to know is on that doc. But also I would recommend favoriting your biology thing on your news app because that gives you some extra ethical like, read those articles in The Atlantic or The Guardian or The Age or whatever talking about why we use CRISPR or why it's dangerous or why it's bad or why it's amazing or why it's good. Stuff like that. Um, hopefully I covered that one. <clears throat> I think I covered this one too. Once again, refer to the FAQ doc. And put some outputs we haven't looked at. We haven't talked about recombinant plasmids at all. I don't think we, um, I don't think it's in my slides today. With recombinant plasmids, once again, this document has a bit on it. So they want you to know about insulin. Um, also know methods of like um, ensuring that your plasmid has been transformed effectively. So know about antibiotic resistance gene 
black Z gene. Um, okay, so they actually insert it to the beta galactosidase protein. So instead of using an antibiotic resistance gene, they actually use that lactose gene and it would change color. And so you can identify if plasmid has been transformed. Um, but I don't have enough time to go into detail about that today. Sorry. Um, there's just so much to remember. Yep, so main things, uh, once again, um, ethical implications is a big thing. And I would expect you guys to get like an essay type question about plasmids where you have to discuss ethical considerations. <clears throat> Let me check that crazy one quick. Yes, CRISPR in agriculture is something you should know, which is why I'm recommending just reading articles because this end part of ACE, they've kind of moved toward a really more holistic understanding of topics. And so instead of just knowing what's in your textbook, they want you to consider real world aspects. So reading the news often and like going out of your way to search up CRISPR and why it's relevant, or just keeping up to date with bio news, like. The Conversation is a really good website for news relating to bio stuff, and it's Australian, um, and they often talk about CRISPR. So knowing ethical, agricultural, um, human effects, religious reasons, stuff like that, all of that is really good, and you have to talk. Like, I would expect you guys to get, like, an eight-mark question for essay type questions, so it's, like, four to eight marks where you have to talk about the ethical stuff and this, like, the implications. Done well. Yes, they'll probably say if it's relating to... Yes, I've done this. Yep. Dude, I'm accidentally... For a common plasmids, when a restriction site is cut in a plasmid and then gene of interest is inserted, do two restriction sites form? Uh, you've got one cut and then you insert a gene of interest. So I guess either side on that gene of interest you've got cuts. So I guess yes, two restriction sites have been formed. You need to ligate both sites. <clears throat> Once again with this, know your basic biology stuff, so how the plasmids work, how they're inserted, the gene of interest, stuff like that, ligase, endonuclease, but also really know ethical stuff. And so I kind of base the ethical, ethical thing on like have a statement, topic sentence, you know, insulin is made with recombinant plasmids, why is this a good thing, why is it a bad thing? Often you'll get an ethical thing like that. Um, I'm not really sure about this one, to be honest. I say methyl cap, to be honest. I I don't think I ever wrote methyl guanosine cap in the exam, but I would say just say it just to be sure. Oh, this is fine to start doing last minute revision because that's what I did. Um, for cloning of human insulin genes, some people wrote PCR instead of cloning of transformed recombinant bacteria. I would say that you want to say transform recombinant bacteria, not PCR. PCR is an amplification technique, whereas um, plasmids are a method of transforming recombinant bacteria. What about this? Okay, I hope I have to find that real quick, and it's on the slides anyway. I'm just trying to cut down these questions so that we don't get too overwhelmed. Uh, with gene expression, eukaryotes and prokaryotes, remember that. Prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, and so the main difference is that they're separated. So in eukaryotes, transcription occurs in nucleus translation in cytosol, whereas in prokaryotes, it just occurs in cytosol, both processes, and they can occur at the same time. If an enzyme is denatured, I would say its tertiary structure is denatured. Um, yeah, tertiary, really. But it really affects, it has multiple level implications. So just say the overall, the radio structure is disrupted. Uh, I don't know if I have time to do that one, but I'll leave it there. Uh, BW means between. Spacer is actually the guide, or it's like keeping it as storage and then using it as a guide later on. Um, the Cas9, yep, so it joins together. So they kind of work together. Like Cas9 is the endonuclease, and the guide RNA is the detection one. Uh, yes, lock and key is an accepted term, but you kind of want to move toward the induced fit model. It's like a more better term. I'm not sure what diagrams we need. <coughs> Anticodon is a segment of the tRNA which reads the codon. Yes, you do need to know post translation and modifications. Um, actually, no, you don't, not really. 
So it's kind of just folding. So, okay, yes, yeah, so you do need to know because this is folding. I think I covered that. Um, I'm not sure if all operons have an operator. Usually they do, but they always have a promoter. Yeah, the regulatory gene is that LAC L, no, LAC L, LAC S or something, which is upstream. That forms the inactive repressor, but that's that's upstream. That's away from the actual operon. Uh, yes, typically yes. Uh, attenuation doesn't bind to anything really. It's more about the ribosome translating it. I already discussed that already. R chains are part of the amino acids. You don't really have to draw anything major. Uh, you do have to know the basic structure of amino acid. You used to. It's not explicitly on the study design anymore, but I would know the basic structure. PAM is protospace or adjacent motif, and it's pretty much just saying, this is where we cut. Cut next to this, okay? So you've got like a sequence, you've got the PAM, the PAM is like cut here. It's like a flag directing you to where to cut. Yeah, I think so. Do we cut food DNA from PAM sequence? Uh, next to the PAM sequence. Yes, I love bio. Um, pretty much with the PAM sequence, you just need to know that this is in the gene of interest. It's the site in the gene of interest. So say I've got like a dog and I want to genetically modify this dog so that it's really fluffy. And um, we're gonna insert a gene in a particular region. This gene is to be inserted next to the fluffy hair gene, right? So, like we need to make a cut of the fluffy hair gene and insert some genes there. And so the PAM sequence will be next to that fluffy hair gene. So it's kind of like a flag saying, yes, come and cut here. And so we've got different PAM sequences for different genes and we'll make it specific. So we wanna have a long eared gene instead We'll find the long-eared PAM, which will be slightly different, and we'll go and identify that and cut there instead. So you can make it specific to a PAM. So it's pretty much what it is. It's like a flag saying, this is where we cut. Um, it is on that doc as well. Uh, yeah, so pretty much it's an, a guide where the guide RNA will cut it. Yeah. Yes, lots of ethics. I'll keep that to the end. And I covered that one. Okay, that was a lot of questions. I don't know where we're at, how many slides we're at. Where are we? We're at coenzymes. Um... How much longer have we got? Okay, a few more slides and then we'll have a break and then we'll come back. I pretty much just put definitions here. NADH and NADPH are like baskets carrying uh, electrons. So they're like high energy baskets. When they have not got electrons in them, you cannot just strip the H away. So NADH is the form which is loaded. It carries electrons. NAD without an H is the unloaded form without electrons. NADPH is the loaded form in plants. Without the H, it's NADP, it's unloaded, it's not carrying electrons. So these molecules here are loaded with electrons, and ATP is our energy molecule. Okay. Okay, photosynthesis has two separate um, stages, I guess. Light-dependent and light-independent reaction. So light-dependent occurs in the grana. What happens is that you want to actually um, form oxygen and split water molecules into hydrogen ions, oxygen, or, or atoms and electrons and form oxygen. The light independent reaction is also known as the Calvin cycle. It occurs in the stroma. Knowing these locations, once again, anything highlighted, you want to know. Um, it's kind of similar to the Krebs cycle, but you turn carbon dioxide into glucose. So this second stage, the light independent reaction, occurs um, in the stroma. It creates glucose, essentially. And so you've got this enzyme Rubisco, which is really important. I haven't put much information about Rubisco, but it is written here. So if you just command F and go Rubisco, this is a really good document, you guys. Like, if you haven't actually looked at it, I would really, really, really recommend it. Because Rubisco has been added to the study design, and you need to know more about it. Um, you've got three different types of plants. C4, C3, and CAM plants, which we'll talk about. So C4 separates light-dependent and independent into different cells. Um, CAM plants separate them into different times. And our C3 plants are the normal plants, I'm pretty sure. I know I've got no information here, but I think there is more on this document too. So just go back and, oh, I don't know what happened there. There's a bit more info here as to why we do that, but um, I don't have enough time. So we're already running quite a bit over. I wanted to spend time on respiration. So this is a summary of the inputs and outputs. I just want you guys to note, the lecture slides say 30 or 32. This is wrong. Um, because overall, the electron transport chain produces, I think it's 22 to 24. They've actually changed it. So, like, listen to me now. These, you don't want to take this as, like, gospel here. You need to go back and consider this, because it says how many um, ATP. I think it's 26 or 28. 
Yeah, so the electron charge change produces 26 or 28 ATP. So this might be right. Okay, this is right. Cool. That, that's fine. Um, but just be aware, because textbooks may not be updated. Some of them are wrong. Beaker has explicitly clarified how many ATP are produced. So you need to know that for sure, okay? 26 or 28 by the electron transport chain. So I think this is fine. But do consider checking with Beaker. Your textbook or your podcast, your roller or whatever. Make sure it's right. The first step is glycolysis or respiration. It occurs in the cytosol. It breaks down um, glucose. And it produces two ATP generally. Um, it says four ATP here. But, so four ATP produced, but two are consumed. So you've got a net production of two ATP. The Krebs cycle, we've got glucose being converted to pyruvate. Pyruvate's a two carbon molecule. We know glucose is a um, six carbon molecule. So we've got two pyruvate being produced. So pyruvate, sorry, a three carbon molecule. So one glucose, which is one six carbon molecule, is split into two three carbon molecules. Then in the Krebs cycle, pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA is converted to carbon dioxide and it forms these things here. So you've actually got NADH, FADH2, which are both electron carriers, as well as ATP and CoA being produced. So you need to know all your inputs and outputs, which I've summarized in that table before. And then finally, the electron transport chain. You've got um, electrons being bounced around through these energy carriers, I guess, or electron carriers. Um, and it creates a proton gradient or a gradient of hydrogen ions which go back and forth. And what happens is that this actually generates, this gradient actually generates energy, I guess, and spins this rotor of this machine. This machine is actually an enzyme. It's called ATP synthase. And so the ATP synthase actually generates ATP and it makes like 26 or 28 ATP. It's kind of amazing. Um, it's a literal like spinning rotor inside of your body which makes energy. Uh, also important to note that this stage here, this is where water is made. Um, so you've got that oxygen being used here and it makes water at the end. So you need to state where that water occurs in the whole respiration um, formula. It occurs in the final stage, the electron transport chain. Okay, that's like a really super thin <laughs> summary of CRISPR. Not useful really, but as I said, go and like seek out articles about CRISPR and its applications and read up on it. Because I think what will separate high scoring students from kind of average students is the extent of your background knowledge here. Like it's not explicitly defined, but if you do read up on it, you'll have a greater basis to argue good points in the exam. Biofuel is another new one, once again, on your doc here. Have a look at the questions. Um, cool, you wanna read up on that because it's new to the study design also. Okay, real quick, and then I'm gonna have a break. So you guys are in your 12 or your 11 doing your 12 subjects. So if you really want to ace your exams, we've got a year 12 revision pass. So it's $379. It's pretty much, you can attend all our live classes for your subjects, um, access previous recordings. So I do bio classes every week. You can have access to all my past bio class recordings as well. Online testing, little mini practice tests and stuff that I set for my students and resources, so slides, flashcards, um, revision worksheets, all that stuff that I set for my students too for all your year 12 subjects. So that's just $379. So if you want to do that, um, go for it. Enroll now at our exam pass website right there. And we've also got one-on-one -on -one private tutoring with me if you want to, or other bio students, bio, bio teachers, I mean, um, individual tutoring. So if you're interested in that, check it out. Book an info call or send me an email. Um, okay, finally, well-deserved break because we've been here for ages, you guys. We're going to come back and then we're going to like go through the rest of content. So immunity evolution and then we're going to get onto like exam stuff so thank you for sticking around we'll be in five minutes and then we'll be back so i'll see you again at 220 and we'll try to get through the rest of the content quickly let me get my shoes <laughs> okay bye you guys we'll be back in five minutes
Hey guys, so we're back. Let me make sure I'm in the frame. Oh, why is my microphone's not working? Um, I'm sure we've got a lot of questions here. Do we need to know in depth about the cavern cycle? Yeah, we do. We really need to know both aspects of photosynthesis, so both, both the um, light dependent and independent reactions. So, yes, we do. Um, I'll go through tips at the end. You need to know the process. I've kind of skimmed it here, but you have to know each individual process in quite a bit of detail. Know the cellular locations, know the inputs and outputs, know how it works. But you don't, like, try and use a textbook or something here because you don't want to go too far. Because we do respiration at uni level and it's quite insane. So you don't want to be going too in depth there. Um, just kind of know your basic processes of glycolysis, Krebs cycle, everything I had on the slide was probably what you need to know. And then electron transport chain, probably know a bit more detail about the proton gradient and ATP synthase. I'm not like ignoring these questions by the way, I'm just giving some of them to the end. Mm. No, you don't need to know monohybrid or dihybrid crosses. <laughs> the next was like my weakest subject at uni and I'm so glad it's not there. I want to say grana instead. Um, thylakoid membranes is okay, grana is better. Rubisco is an enzyme. Um, I'm going to try to keep that to the end because I think we might run out of time. It's just so much to cover. But it's an enzyme which is involved in photosynthesis. Um, it's involved in the carbon fixation stage, so it fixes carbon. I, I think really just coming back to this document, I know all the time I'm just pointing you back here, but just because I know there is a lot to cover and we don't have enough time particularly to do all of that today. And so I have tried to put in as much info as I can, um, but yeah, really come back to here. So Rubisco is that fixation enzyme. Um, so actually both carbon dioxide and oxygen combine to Rubisco's active site. Rubisco is just generally known, like, world-renowned. It's just kind of like a really low-key, slow, like, not useless exactly, but kind of bad enzyme. There's a really good, um, website about Rubisco, actually. Or, like, an article. I think it's literally the first website which comes up when you write Rubisco. Um, and I remember reading up on it and just thinking, that's so interesting. So this really describes Rubisco really well. It's like a scientific-looking page. Um... This one, PDB. They have Molecule of the Month, Rubisco. I'd recommend coming here. Um, and they kind of have a bit of background about Rubisco and how it fixes carbon. And just a bit of extra info. Like, it's kind of like a rubbishy enzyme. I think it's literally... It's remarkably inefficient. Like, it's just world-renowned as being really slow and slightly useless. But obviously it's not useless because it does work. Um, but it's not very effective. So, that's... Come to this website if you're curious about Rubisco. It's literally like the third website there. Um, Enzyme of the month, Rubisco. Um, so with this bio doc, just literally look up 2022 bio exam FAQ beaker. Bio beaker FAQ. Bio. Ah, bio beaker FAQ doc. Mm -hmm. There you go. And that's it. I'm not going to open it because it's a doc and it's going to take ages. But I've already opened it, so you've seen it already. Um, I'm going to try and answer these real quick because we're going to get back into content because I want to have 30 minutes to answer your questions properly and go through like revision tips. Yep, so you want to know restriction endonucleosides, you want to know anti, yeah I think you do want to know these. Um, I don't think they're fully ex explicitly defined, it's like, like the exact names here, but you need to know that when you make a restriction enzyme, First, you want to cut it with the restriction endonuclease. Then you want to insert the gene of interest. You need to have the antibiotic resistance side as well. Um, origin of replication is important, just knowing where it is, and then ligase and stuff like that as well. Spacer is kind of like the guide. It recognizes... Spacer is when you've got, in the natural bacteria, when a virus invades, it will take a copy of that invading DNA or RNA and save it, and that's the spacer. Yeah, going to be lots of ethical questions. I would expect you have to like eight marks on that because it, it was even on my study design, ethical stuff relating to like genome editing technologies. Um, and now it's explicitly on your study design. So I'd expect a really big, like six mark question on at least. 
Um, yeah, CRISPR does create a genetically modified organism. So you are making changes. You're genetically modifying it using CRISPR. You're either cutting it, deleting it, adding things, stuff like that. You need to know CRISPR really well. So once again, I'm highly recommending just seeking out like articles discussing it. Regulatory genes encode for molecules which can either like enhance transcription or repress it, stuff like that. So they're not structural. They don't make the protein the end product protein, like tryptophan, but they make proteins which will interfere with the transcription. Um, non-competitive inhibition is often irreversible. So things like ricin, I think, is a poison, and it's a non-competitive inhibitor, but I think a lot of them are reversible. So it really kind of depends. Loaded means it's carrying electrons. Unloaded means it's not. Uh, I'm not sure what this is, the linking, but it might be the, the pre-Krebs cycle one, just talking about pyruvate conveying to acetyl-CoA. This one, just, I would recommend that slide I gave you, the full summary. Print that out, then copy and paste that, and delete all the writing from it, and try and fill it in yourself, and keep doing that over and over and over again. The PAM sequence is already naturally in the DNA, so we seek out those sites. Um, uh, you need to know that NADH is the loaded form, NAD plus is not, so it's the unloaded form. ATP is energy rich, ADP is less energy rich, stuff like that. You don't need to know specific steps, just that which one is the loaded and which is unloaded. I'm just going to point you to this website. It's not a very long read. It kind of just discusses fixation, and it's quite a slow molecule. You don't have to read all of that, but just this, this, this bit here is very good. Um, all plants are most effective depending on their environment. So some plants which live in the desert might need to use C4 uh, mechanisms instead of C3. So it really depends. Um, in your environment. Cool, okay, we've got 30 minutes to get through the next like 60 slides or 100 slides or whatever it is. Where, where are my slides? Okay, real quick here, we have got Add Unlimited. So please write this down, it's a really good code, Angelica VC, it's my code. If you guys are looking for extra resources, we can go to Add Unlimited and it's a really great resource, which is sad, but it's kind of like, like the Netflix of study guides. Um, so you've got like a million Maybe not a million, but several hundred um, practice exams, summary guides, course notes, text response summaries. There was just a ton of them. So I'll show you my account real quick. It's usually you have to pay for it, but right now it's free for three weeks. And seeing as most of you guys have exams in like three weeks, I'd really recommend just going for it right now. Um, and even if you want to cancel it, that's fine. At least you have some use out of it for the next few weeks. So you have access to all of these course notes for every single subject. Like, my laptop's going to start freezing up. But you see my scroller? See how, how long this is going to be scrolling for? These are all our English guides. Different practice exams. Look at how many practice exams we have. All your subjects. Lots of bio ones especially, which is really good. Because I would recommend doing like 20 exams. So yeah, there is a lot. Of content here. Um, so we just go bio, you can go to the course notes, where are the course notes, bio 3 and 4, oh there they are. Um, so for the new study design, you just go through, open it, and I'll show you what it looks like. It kind of just summarizes everything you need to know. I personally really love the physical book, so you can also order that on the AFI Notes website, but this is really good too. Um, like it summarizes everything you need to know. Um, so yeah, use my code AngelicaVC if you're interested in that. And okay, now we gotta like go through real quick. Uh, yeah, gRNA and cRNA is, is very similar. Kind of the same. Given the context of ether. Electroporation is just the holes in the electrophoresis, I think. Or things traveling through the holes. No, sorry, electroporation is when you like shock something and make it more receptive. So yeah, you do need to know about that. It's making the plasmids more receptive to actually taking up uh, the gene of interest. Yes. Okay, okay. Let's go back here. Many different pathogen types. Really just know bacteria and viruses really well. Know that specific immunity and non-specific are different. Non-specific is the one you're kind of born with. It's it's non-specific, obviously. It has no immunological memory, whereas this one does. And so the response is subsequently greater each time you encounter the same pathogen. 
You need to know your first lines of defense, all of these different physical barriers and chemical barriers as well. Instead of saying skin, you must say intact skin. Otherwise you won't get marks. Intact skin, not just skin. Okay, so it's really important. Um, but know like at least five of these. Okay, so with immunity, we've got markers, um, MHC class one and MHC class two markers. I think of them as like a platter. They present peptide. And so MHC class one are found in all nucleated cells. So all cells with a nucleus. So red blood cells don't have a nucleus, therefore they don't have MHC class one markers. Anyway, MHC class one markers present self antigen. So say you've got like a liver cell with a nucleus, and so it's got an MHC class one marker and it presents liver antigen saying, look, this is my liver. I am a liver. Everyone observes. Right? Whereas the MHC class 2 is found on specific immune cells only. So on our um, dendritic cells, right, or phagocytes, or, sorry, not all phagocytes, some phagocytes, just macrophages, MHC class 2 are presenting non-self antigens. So like a phagocyte such as a macrophage will go and engulf the pathogen, digest it, keep its peptide, and present on its MHC class 2 marker and say, look, foreign peptide, I have seen this, this pathogen get into our body. Find this pathogen and go and kill it. So it's kind of like a warning to let everyone else know. Um, yep. So the innate <clears throat> system. So once the first line defense is breached, oh, this is dying. <clears throat> so once the first line defense is breached, the second line is initiated. This involves a very broad response to eliminate the pathogen through use of leukocytes and numerous non cellular molecules. Uh, just know all of these. Once again, flashcard, all of these. You need to know all of these cell types and what they do and their functions and where they're found. And yeah, you need to know all of them. I know it's a lot of memorization. The thing is that with immunity, this stuff kind of sucks. You've got to memorize it. But I would make really ridiculous mnemonics. Like I go, mast cell. Okay, mast cells release histamine. And so when I say mast, it makes me think of a pirate ship with a mast. And so I think of like, I literally draw out a pirate ship and I draw a mast and I draw a flagpole with a, a flag and on the flag I wrote histamine on it. Which is the most bizarre mnemonic, right? But it made me think, okay, mast cell. It made me think of my pirate ship drawing with a histamine flag. And it helped me remember, okay, mast cells release histamine. So that's kind of like how I remember stuff. I have to draw really ridiculous pictures. Um, or dendritic cells and macrophages. I would draw these like cells literally eating something, like little speech bubbles, munching and stuff. So they're like all these sound effects or whatever associated with them. Just so I know that they're eating their phagocyte cells. They're phagocytic, so they're gonna eat things. That just helped me remember it. Or um, neutrophils, like they would die after, like they, they kamikaze. Um, they will undergo apoptosis after phagocytosis. So they will eat a pathogen and then they will die. And I would draw like a little gravestone next to my neutrophils to make me remember, oh yeah, they're the pus. Stuff like that. Drawings help me, even if they are kind of stupid. So, if that helps you, I'd recommend. Um, so yeah. Okay, phagocytosis is the process whereby you've got something eating. Phago is eat, cytosis or cyto is cell, cell eating. So this is part of the innate immune system. You've got a, a phagocyte, it will eat some kind of pathogen, such as a bacterium, it will form a phagosome. It will actually uh, combine with a lysosome containing um, digestive enzymes and they will form a phagolysosome. Then it will break down that that bacterium and expel it. But it will also retain that little peptide, its flag, and put it up in the MHC class 2 marker as like a platter presenting that peptide. Uh, this is the inflammatory response. So the best thing about immunity is that it happens to you. Like I walk into tables all the time and then I get like a bruise and I can think about, oh look, it's swelling and stuff like that. So my cells getting damaged, they release cytokines and you've got inflammation or redness there, right? Like, I want you guys to take a step back and kind of think about everything as, like, a natural process. So, immunity happens, right? It just, like, occurs in your daily life. So, if you think about it, okay, I am, um, well, my cat scratched me yesterday. So, my cat scratched my hand. My finger is swelling because of that. That's inflammation. So, my damaged cells have released cytokines such as you know, histamine and other molecules. Maybe my cut's gotten infected, and so some bacteria has gotten into my cut, and so as a result, I've got more inflammation, and so macrophages will release more cytokines and trapped more immune cells to the area, and you've got more swelling because of this cut being infected. So histamine is released. As a result, histamine encourages the blood vessels to vasodilate or get bigger. As a result, more blood cells will come to the area. It also makes the blood vessels more leaky or permeable, meaning that more of those immune cells can leave the blood and get to that site of infection and tackle it. So I've got like macrophages and dendritic cells and stuff coming in and eating up that, that pathogen. And also the neutrophils, right? 
I might have some pus because my cuts get infected now because I have let some bacteria get in because they didn't disinfect it. And so as a result, that's dead neutrophils. Um, and then if, if it's a really serious problem and this is like a really deadly virus or bacteria or something like a tetanus bacterium, um, perhaps my antipathetic cells are engulfing it and presenting peptide and going off and telling the rest of my immune system, like, look, we've got a serious problem here. So I kind of like thinking of everything in a logical sequence, like think, imagining everything happening. I think with immunity, what you need to do is take a step back and like remember that you have to know all of this for the exam. There's no point memorizing it like that. You have to walk yourself through every step logically. It's a, like a logical process. It makes sense. You're hurt. Your body wants to fix you. You need to think about it in your head like that and kind of walk through every process. And it takes a lot of brain power and it's quite mentally fatiguing too. But doing so will help you to remember it. We're really running out of time here. So let's just go through. These are all just slides telling you exactly what you need to know. I'm going to explain this one and then we're going to kind of like try and get through the rest of content because yikes, we've got like so much left. Okay, so sometimes we need to progress to the adaptive immune response if we've got a serious issue and that pathogen has not evaded or been killed off yet. So we've got an antigen presenting cell such as a macrophage or a, um, a dendritic cell. They will engulf that pathogen. These are antigen presenting cells. So they will present the antigen. They'll actually migrate to the lymph node because the lymph node is the meeting place for the rest of the adaptive immune system. So they will go to the lymph node and present to a T helper cell. So they will tell the T helper cell, look, peptide or antigen from a foreign invader. Get ready, we've got to like initiate a whole attack here. And so that T helper cell will actually activate the B cell. Um, B cell will proliferate, so will T helper cell. So T helper cell will proliferate, make memory. Um, to also make, uh, activate the B cells and T cytotoxic killer cells. The B cells will make plasma B cells and these make antibody. They will also make memory B cells to enable long-term retention of this um, knowledge of that pathogen and make sure that our next response is a lot faster. We've got memory T cells, both cytotoxic and helper, and then we've also got active cytotoxic T killer cells. And those will go through and kill any cells that have been virally infected. Okay, so kind of just walk yourself through this entire process. What happens? Why does an, a macrophage eat a pathogen? Well, it eats it so that it can digest it and get its peptide and present to a T helper cell. What happens to the T helper cell? Well, the T helper cell kind of activates the rest of the adaptive immune response. It activates the B cells, activates the T cytotoxic killer cells, activates the plasma cells, activates the memory, right? It's really important in kind of initiating all of these responses. So kind of walking through every single one of those processes is the most important thing, I think. This is just about plasma cells. The plasma cells make antibody. Antibody are involved in agglutination, optimization, activating a complement, neutralization, inflammation. I'm going to go through this real quick, but agglutination is clumping. Opsonization is making something more tasty. So like bread is good, right? But bread with like butter is like so much better. So it's kind of like making the pathogen tastier. So you like throw a bunch of antibodies at a pathogen. All of a sudden the phagocytes are like, yes, I love it. It's so delicious. I'm going to eat it. So it's kind of what it does. Opsonization is making something more tasty. It activates complements. So complements kind of like antibodies, but they're proteins, different proteins. Uh, neutralize the pathogen and promote inflammation. It's just like recruiting. So main functions. T cytotoxic killer cells recognize um, cells which have been infected usually. So this cell has been compromised. Let's kill it. That's what a, C a T cytotoxic killer cell does. And it releases like granules via a death receptor apoptotic pathway. So like induces cell lysis. So the picture's covering that. Um, I don't have a lot of info here about monoclonal antibodies. Is there information on here about it? I don't think I've got enough time and I want to give you a resource for it. Okay, there is quite a bit here, so I'd recommend going back and looking at that. Um, apart from that, I will just try and go through it, some of it, as much as I can. Okay, so let me draw. This might take a few minutes, so hopefully time to just go through evolution because you guys are probably doing evolution now or you will do it very soon so this is our virus this is our covid virus or some other virus perhaps we know viruses will bind to receptors and enter our cells okay 
they bind to receptors and enter our cells. So with the COVID, okay, with this particular virus, only this one binds and enters our cell, the blue ones, not the green ones. Okay, so the green ones don't really do much. But if your body recognizes a virus, it's going to be like, oh my God, virus. Your um, APCs are going to digest it and they're going to present peptide, both the green and blue peptides, and they're going to try and recruit adaptive immune responses with both of these peptides, yeah? Because this is a polyclonal virus. It's got different... Um, kind of like this, this definition here, sort of like that. I'm just going to simplify it. So your body is going to initiate a polyclonal response. It's going to make different antibodies produce these different antigens. Well, there's one antigen with multiple epitopes. Um, so different variants of the same antigen, kind of. And so what happens is that we know that the green ones are kind of useless. There's no point in wasting energy making antibodies which will bind to the green one. So what we should do is try and target the blue one only. And so we can do this in the lab. So some cancer cells actually have multiple epitopes. We want to direct a response against one particular one because we know that only one of them is harmful. Only one of them, you know, gets into the cells and makes them cancerous. And so in the lab, we can actually specifically take a mouse. We'll get some cancer cells because cancer cells live forever. So we'll just exploit the, the living forever potential of the cancer cells. We'll get some plasma cells because plasma cells make antibodies. And we'll get a plasma cell which makes antibody specifically for the blue one. So we've got antibodies. We've got plasma cells which make antibodies for green and blue. We don't care about the green. We only take the antibodies which make the blue. And so we kind of cross this blue making antibody with a cancer cell. And so you form a hybridoma. So it's a like a cancer cell slash plasma cell. And this is a cell which will theoretically live forever. It's really strong because cancer cells are amazing like that. But it will specifically make antibodies specifically for that blue antigen there. And so you kind of make a ton of antibodies in a lab and then you've got a bunch of antibodies. And so you can actually just put that into the patient and they'll go and target that cancer cell. So that's a monoclonal antibody. It's targeted against a single, a mono antigen. And the best part is you can actually fix things to them. So you can attach poisons and the poisons will attach to that, that monoclonal antibody you just made. When you inject them into that person, these are highly specific only to the cancer cell and only to this particular antigen too. So we'll go and target it and then it will kill that cancer cell. So monoclonal antibodies have huge potential in treating cancer. Um, so I hope that makes a bit of sense. Perhaps maybe re-listen to that whole segment later on if you've got some time because I think it's important that you guys do understand that. Okay, we've got different methods of pathogen identification. Serology is a blood test. ELIAs are another blood test where you've got wells. You um, add the blood to some wells. If it binds to a particular protein, you know that something is present, like some kind of pathogen is present perhaps. Some antigen is present. It will fluoresce or it will be visible or change colour and you can literally see it. And then PCR is polymerase chain reaction. We know that our COVID tests are often PCR tests. It took me a while to understand this, but with the PCR test, right, PCR is an amplification method. How does that help us like, like figure out if we've got an antigen present? Remember that with PCR, though, you've got your um, DNA and you've got primers. So what happens is that with the PCR test, we've got primers specific for COVID. And so we give you, we take your, your sample of your saliva or whatever, and we check for COVID. If the COVID's present, the primer will bind and we'll have amplification occur. And we can literally see that amplification process. If you don't have COVID, no primers will bind because they don't have anywhere to bind to. Therefore, we won't have any application. Therefore, we won't see any reaction. Therefore, we can say you don't have COVID. Okay? So that's how the PCR test works. Oh, my nose is like, I've got memories of getting PCR tests. Okay. Um, cool. We're near the end. Different modes of trans um, transmission. Do know all of these. Make sure you're on top of them. Okay, we've got a few mutations here. Uh, they're kind of just summarized here. So silent has no effect on the, on the uh, protein sequence. So you might have a single nucleotide change, results in the same amino acid. Mysense results in a change in amino acid. Nonsense results in a premature stop codon. Make sure you know your stop codons. And then you've got insertion and deletion. This results in a shift in the reading frame. So either moving forward or backwards. And it's going to have highly detrimental effects because it actually subsequently affects all subsequent proteins afterward. Sorry, amino acids afterward. And can ultimately really affect the protein structure. And also it often results in a premature stop codon. Block mutations are on the chromosomal level. You can have deletion of an entire segment of chromosomes, duplication, inversion, insertion, translocation. Uh, make sure you know your stop codons. I always say this. I feel like people like associate with me now, but they sound like a couple breaking up. 
that's how I like remember my stop codons. Um, remember your start codon is AUG, like August. So with the stop codons, I always think of like a couple fighting. So they're like, you are gone. Just think of words associated with these letters. You are away. You go away. And the couple is just about to like end it because they're so mad at each other. Which is kind of a stupid mnemonic, but once again, these things help me. So I would literally draw out the stick figures and have them yelling at each other like this in shouty capitals. And it just helps me remember the end of the stop codons. The end of their relationship is the end of the protein sequence. So, um, yeah. Okay, natural selection. We've got like 13 minutes. Okay, I put in some um, slides here for natural selection. If you go through and pass beaker exams, they use the same formula to answer natural selection questions every year. Like, I'm, like they don't give you that formula, but I've just been going through like a million prep exams and I noticed this. But what happens is that they give you a natural selection question and you have to answer it usually three or four marks. And what you have to say always, the first thing you should always say is variation exists in a population. So variation already exists. The selection pressure acts on the phenotype, not genotype, the phenotypes, the physical characteristics. The alleles that correlate with the characteristics that give survival advantage are therefore more likely passed on and increase in frequency, which means over time, population evolves to suit the environment. Something along these lines means you'll get full marks. So I'm just going to summarize this. It's just talking about a mosquito and uh, there was some kind of pesticide. Over time, some mosquitoes become resistant and these mosquitoes increase, like the frequency of that allele increases. Using the information above, explain how natural selection has operated on this population of mosquitoes. So you can see that this allelotypes increase over time because it governs or gives um, uh, resistance, resistance gene. So you'd say um, variation already exists. So variation exists in the mosquito population, with some mosquitoes having allelotype one, which um, confers resistance, and some mosquitoes having allelotype two. Over time, mosquitoes who are not resistant to the a pesticide are going to die and so there will be a decrease in the number of alleles of allele type 2. Consequently over time there will be fewer allele type 2 in the mosquito population whereas there will be an increased number of allele type 1 in the mosquito population as this governs resistance or confers resistance. Um, so subsequently this um, allele will increase in frequency. Something like that will give you full marks. If you look at their answer. Variation exists. The selection pressure is the insecticide. So you want to say that Specifically, so the selection pressure is whatever, it kills whatever. The allele for resistance, blah, blah, blah. Something like that. Selective breeding. So breeders choose which members of a species are allowed to breed. So pretty much pugs are an example of selective breeding. Pugs used to be like snouted dogs. And someone like hundreds of years ago decided that a flat like snouted pug looked really cool, even though it was a mutant. And so people decided to breed these. And so I'm really against pug breeders because it's really bad for their nose and their breathing. They have respiratory problems. And people keep breeding them even though it's bad for them, which I think is really unfair. And like, nothing against you if you've got a pug, but like, understanding that people are breeding this based on the aesthetic and not caring about the actual respiratory system of the dog. Um, anyway, so someone decides that something is a cool trait or a good trait, like maybe some cows which are really buff or like better tasting or something like that, or more meat there. And so they, humans act as a selection pressure here. And so they pick traits which they like. Um, yeah. I'm not really going to go through these because I'm sure you guys have spent quite a bit of time on it. But know these definitions. Anything highlighted, make a flash cut out of it. Genetic drift is changes in allele frequencies between one generation and the next due to chance events. Memorize that. Flash cut it. Make a flash cut out of it. Or even what I did in um, second year for genetics in particular is I made this ginormous Word document with like hundreds of questions. Just for every single slide I got given for my lectures, I'd make flashcards, or sorry, questions for every single slide, like three or four questions per slide. And I end up with like 270 pages of questions. And so I put the answers there as well. And then I duplicated that entire Word doc and got rid of all the answers. And then I had like a, a question or like worksheet slides or page or whatever, wor worksheet Word doc and an answer sheet doc. And I'd go through the worksheet one and try and answer every single question. So just making questions like that is also a good alternative to flashcards. Because flashcards are annoying sometimes. Or annoying to find a good app, because I don't know any good apps for flashcards right now. Um, 
uh, mosquitoes can become resistant to pesticides, bacteria can also become resistant. So this can happen if you don't follow the course of an antibiotic treatment in full, if you overprescribe antibiotics for no real good reason. Um, and yeah, those are the two main reasons. And so over time, your bacteria will become more resistant. And so it's harder to actually treat bacterial infections. Antigenic shift and drift. So I had a question about this. Drift thinks, makes me think of long-term stuff. So drifting is very slow. So just random mutations you accumulate over time due to chance events. Whereas antigenic shift is a major change. And what happens is you've got the COVID virus and some other random virus. They kind of mix together. They mix their RNA together. And they actually swap out their cell surface peptides to create a new mutant variant of COVID. And that's how we end up with Centaurus or Omicron or whatever. Because it's just a sudden change. It's mixed with another virus. Switch, um, switch out its cell surface peptides and created a new mutant variant and we need a new vaccine for this and it's really annoying. Um, yeah, so antigenic shift is a lot more drastic, it occurs a lot faster, drift is a slow thing over time. Um, Allopatric speciation. Oh my god, there are like 60 questions. Uh, monoclonal antibodies are not only used against agonist cancer cells, they may be used for other things too, but they typically do use them against cancer cells. I think I talked about this. So GMOs just mean genes have been modified slightly. You may have just inserted a gene, deleted, added, whereas transgenic is you've inserted a gene from another organism. So for instance, you may have inserted a fluorescent protein or whatever from a jellyfish and made it fluorescent green. Reversible means um, it can unbind. Whereas irreversible means once that, that inhibitor is bound, it can never leave. It's pretty much just destroyed that enzyme. It's no longer functional. And so poisons like ricin, that's how they work. They bind irreversibly to your enzymes in your body and stop them working. Yeah, you do need to know the inputs and outputs and the numbers. It's really kind of suckish, but you have to know them. Sorry. Um, I'm going to try to take five minutes to get through the rest of this stuff. Once again, allopatric speciation. This is separation of individuals based on geographical barriers. You've got a formula to answer this, which I've given you here. So first you want to say geographic isolation occurred, preventing gene flow. Over time, um, different selection pressures act on different environments. And so the, different, the species will be exposed to different selection pressures. And so they will become slightly different. When the populations are brought back together, they're no longer able to produce fertile viable offspring. That's our definition of species. Individuals which can produce fertile viable offspring are of the same species. And if they can't do so, they're no longer the same species. And so we've got things like Galapagos finches, which are an example of that. And here is where I'd recommend just being curious about biology. Like I follow this random lady on TikTok or Instagram, Lindsay Nicole, and she's like a marine biologist. And she just does little reels about stuff like this. And so I just thought it's interesting, like stuff like that. Or watching David Attenborough documentaries. Like I decided to watch a David Attenborough documentary with my parents like two nights before the exam. And it talked about Galapagos finches. And that was... Obviously relevant, so I could talk about allopatric speciation. Just kind of increasing your background knowledge is a really good thing here. <sighs> okay. Sympatric speciation is separation of species due to other forms of isolation. Because they could be living right next to each other, but they're not going to actually, like, mate or, like, breed. Could be due to time. So maybe some plants flower at different times. I don't know if you guys know this, but, like, kiwi plants, you need a guy kiwi plant and a Okay, okay, you need a male and a female kiwi plant in order for them to like flower and produce kiwi fruits. Um, and so some plants are like that, like the Lord Howia palms. And so they may be separated temporally. Like one may breed in the spring only or flower in the spring, whereas one may breed or flower in the autumn. Um, or animals, right? Some birds may not mate with each other because they don't like the behavior of another bird or their like mating rituals are different. Or even like just sexual compatibility just literally physically doesn't work with some plants or animals. <sighs> okay, I'm sort of like breathless. <clears throat> I'm going to go through fossils quite quickly. I pretty much covered everything you need to know kind of on the slides here. So you can come back and refer to it and you can just read off the slides. So I want to get into stuff which is actually useful. So here are some good conditions for fossilization. You must know these, make a note of all of them, you should know that, okay? That's important. I expect them to ask at least one question on name two conditions needed for fossilization and that's two marks worth in your exam 
Transitional fossils are in between fossils. So like the ancestral group and this current group is like a in between one. So like whales used to walk on land. Obviously now they just swim, but you might find a fossil which is like a, a whale with legs and fins. So it's kind of like an in between one. And once again, just following random marine biologists and like TikTok or whatever is the good thing here. We've got some stuff about relative age. These are three methods. The main thing I want you to take away is that relative age is not giving you the absolute age. It's more of a comparison of kind of saying, we know this probably leave, lived within this time period or this set of years, something like that. Absolute dating is a method whereby you can actually date um, uh, an organism quite accurately. So we have to talk about carbon dating and uranium lead dating. So what happens is that you've got carbon-14, which is a radioactive isotope. It wants to decay to nitrogen-14, which is a stable form. It has a half-life of 5,730 years. So say a dinosaur dies, it has this much carbon-14 in it. Pretend that's completely coloured in. Um, after 5,730 years, it has half the initial amount of carbon-14 in it. After another 5,730 years, it has half of that amount, so it only has a quarter left. Okay, and so each one of these jumps, like in half, that's called a half-life. And so each half-life is 5,730 years. And so what happens is that when the dinosaur died, it had carbon-14 in it, and also had carbon-12, and it had the same amount of carbon-12 and carbon-14. Carbon-12 is a stable form, it won't decay. And so we can actually compare this and go, hey, look, this is the in, like original amount of carbon-12, and this is the amount of carbon-14 we have. If we like times that by two and then times by two again, then we get the full amount, which means we've had two half-lives. And so we can determine how old a fossil is like that. That's how carbon dating works. Um, know that carbon dating is, has a limit of about 50 to 60,000 years old. So anything older than that, you can't really date because then the amount of carbon-14 gets so tiny, like such a tiny little fraction, it's hard to tell. Um, this is potassium argon, but you guys don't need to know much about it, but do look up uranium lead. It's a similar process, just about uranium, um, and it can be used to date things which are a lot older than carbon dating. So if you can't use carbon dating, you probably want to use potassium lead, sorry, not potassium lead, uranium lead, um, and the uranium, obviously it's got to be a material which has uranium in it, like a rock, um, whereas carbon dating is mostly used for organic substances, so living things like trees or animals or people. Um, dinosaurs, they all breathe in carbon from the atmosphere. So you'd expect them to have carbon in them, but it can only date stuff up to 50,000 years old. Anything older than that, you probably want to use another method. Oh, I've been talking for a long time. Um, okay, structural morphology real quick. Homologous structures are um, similar structure, different function. Like, I've got an arm, a bird has a, a wing, a dog has a paw. It's kind of similar structure. But we use them for different ways. Like I use it to grab things. Dogs use it to walk. Birds use it to fly. Analogous is same function but different structure, meaning they're not really closely related. So like a bird and a butterfly actually have different wings. They're not related really, not closely related at all. But they look like they kind of are, just because they have similar environmental circumstances. An vestigial structure is a structure that was fully functional in ancestor, but doesn't have any real function anymore, and so it's really small. Like if you look at a whale skeleton, they actually have a pelvis bone which is proof that whales did walk on land, but it's so tiny now. Or like our appendix, we think that's a vestigial structure too. We don't know what it's used for. It's just there. Okay, molecular homology. This is kind of determining relatedness of um, species. We can sequence DNA. We can sequence amino acids. DNA sequencing is better because it compares all the tiny changes, whereas amino acids, we might have silent changes, right? So different nucleotide changes, but same amino acid produced. And so this one's the most accurate one. I know I'm going through this so fast, you guys, um, but it's all on the slide, so you can come back and refer to it later. Okay, so phylogenetic trees are pretty much just showing relatedness of species. Mammals definition, you must know that mammals have mammary glands. I actually thought that the definition of mammals was something which gives birth as opposed to lays an egg. But platypus are mammals, and they, they lay eggs. Well, actually, they're monotremes. So the main thing about mammals is that they feed their young with their mammary glands. Mammal, mammary... So they give them um, their young milk. You know these like random points here? So anything I've got purple, anything underneath you want to associate. So primates, these are some characteristics of primates, know them. Hominoids, these are some characteristics of hominoids, know them. Hominins, know this as well. Um, okay, the best part about this area of study is we don't really know what's going on. Okay, so every time they've got a new study design change, they've changed their theories because we don't, we would, 
like, you and I were not there. We could not see this happening. We don't know the truth of the circumstances. And many people actually don't even believe in evolution. Um, I believe in evolution. Anyway, we've got different theories, so we don't know which one is completely true. I Meaning we don't know the correct ordering of all these species. We don't know who came first or why they arose in this way or what happened to them. But you need to know some things. So we need to know that humans are bipedal. We've got this hole in our head called the foramen magnum. It's usually quite central, right? Which means that our vertebrae sits kind of in the middle of our skull. Whereas in the more inferior species, supposedly, our ancestor species, this Roman magnum is more to the back of their head, and so they're less bipedal, because this is good for bipedalism, or standing on two legs. Whereas in these less advanced species, um, they're less bipedal, they walk on four legs, and so that thing towards the back of their head. You kind of want to understand that this entire area of study is kind of directed between saying, like, at saying that we as Homo sapiens are like the most superior species and everyone else before us is not. <laughs> Which sounds harsh, but it's like saying that we are bipedal, okay? And so bipedalism is like the instigator of all of our, like, superiority. Because being bipedal meant that we stand on two legs. Therefore, our hands are free. So because we're standing on two legs, we can see upright. We can see our predators from far away. We can see our prey. We've got free hands, so we can, like, make spears and kill animals and make fires and cook food and eat it and pick berries and climb up trees higher and like it just kind of like confers us to a better diet and escaping from predators better and therefore we've got increased nutrition because we're also like hunting animals better as well and cooking food and we're just getting more nutrition and therefore we're smarter so it's like bipedalism so all these factors such as a more central form of magnum an arched foot um my friend calls these anime girl legs but this is called a bicondylar angle all of these are conducive toward bipedalism. Bipedalism is conducive toward becoming more advanced because it means you're like hunting, cooking, eating, whatever, all of these different factors. And so as a result, you're becoming smarter and you're a more superior species with increased cranial capacity. And that's what led to us as humans today. So the main thing, I'm gonna go through these. Okay, these are some more traits associated. So greater skull, increased cranial capacity, smaller teeth size, so we don't need to like chew so ginormous because our we're cutting food up, we've got smaller food, we've got changes in diet, stuff like that. Um, less zygomatic arches, so those are the cheekbones. They're not as ginormous anymore or bulky. They're becoming smaller because we don't need to chew so massive, once again, because our diets change, because we can like cook food and cut it up. All of this is really like leading to the fact that our brain size is bigger now. So smaller teeth, because we can chew smaller, we've got better nutrients in our diet. Increased cranial capacity. Um, by the way, so the homo neanderthalensis doesn't fit this trend. So homo neanderthalensis supposedly had a bigger cranial capacity than us but apparently part of its brain was smaller or something, just because um, it had a larger body size. Okay, so I know I've just like glossed through all of this, but I want you to just observe the order. Afarensis is like our ancient ancestor. If they are ancient to us, we're going to have to think of some differences between us. I'm not going to ask you to like memorize all of this, but if you just think we're really advanced, what is something unadvanced? And think about that. So... Okay, our ancestor is going to have a smaller brain than us. Decreased cranial capacity. So if we're going to talk about some traits associated with this one, we know they've got a decreased cranial capacity. We know they've got a less of a bicondylar angle in their legs. We know that they've got less, well, greater eyebrow ridge or greater cheekbones, larger teeth, because they're not chewing small things or eating nutrients. They're chewing ginormous. They've got like a really bad diet. Um, they've got less of an arched foot. They're more flat-footed because they're not as bipedal as us. Their forum and magnum is less centralized and actually more posterior toward the back of their head because they're not walking on two legs as well as us. All of these traits. So really kind of know the ordering and kind of be able to say, like, you know, as you progress through the years and go through this order, they're going to become more and more advanced until we get to Homo sapiens, which are, like, the most advanced. So I wouldn't say memorize particular traits. You don't need to know the brain size like this, but you do need to know the older species are, like, dumber, sort of. Like, I don't want to say that because that sounds really horrible, but it's just... They're less advanced than us because different diet and stuff. And so as a result, smaller cranial capacity and less bipedal, stuff like that. Okay. So I hope that's like a good hack for that. And um, these are some other homo species. Just know a bit about them. Homo sapiens and homo neanderthals, there's evidence that they interbred. You probably have neanderthal DNA. Probably so do I. If we have neanderthal DNA and we can produce fertile viable offspring, which means we're the same species as a neanderthal. So pretty much it kind of throws up our entire species definition into the air like what is this we are not we're the same species how okay this shouldn't say immunity sorry that's an issue with the headings but mitochondrial dna is just a measure of um 
well, we only get mitochondrial DNA from our mothers, so you can like trace it back to the maternal line and see DNA mutations of how they occurred. We've got two hypotheses for evolution, the out of Africa hypothesis or the more original one. You pick one, whichever one you resonate with. I personally like this one. So Homo sapiens evolved in Africa, then we moved out of Africa, and we migrated across all over the globe. So I'm starting to like lose speech now. Um, and as a result, we've got different species or different like people all over the world, and different species elsewhere. Okay, now we're at the end. I'm going to go through your questions. All of this is just stuff like basic revision points, which you guys can read. I'm going to go through this because I think that's important. <sighs> Okay, I'm going to give you guys like a rundown of my study and how I study for the exam. Okay, so firstly, the subject I did in year 12 and year 11, I did biology and Indonesian in year 11 as year 12 subjects. Then I did methods, chemistry, English, and PA. Um, I nearly failed methods, so don't ask for me any math help. But with biology, I did that in year 11. And as I said before, I remember like just memorizing stuff out the year for the exams and just forgetting it. So I wasn't retaining it in the long term. And so by the time I got to September holidays, I actually went to one of these Atonix lectures and it was in the big lecture theater. And I remember freaking out because there was some kid next to me who'd done like 30 practice exams and I'd done none. And I was like literally sitting there not knowing what transcription was. And so what I did was I printed out the entire study design, like the entire study design. And I think I laminated it and I put it up on my wall and I would like tick off each dot point as I went through it. I also bought some summary books, so I really like this one. I really wish this company would just like you know, send me more because I thought they were really good. Um, but you can also get the ATAR notes ones. So I like this one personally, but the ATAR notes one's also really good. Um, my brother loves the ATAR notes one. ATAR notes Mary. I'm just trying to write summary book. Oh, so I showed you an Ed Unlimited. Um, I think it's called Course Notes or Course Guide or something like that. So you can just buy that, click a physical copy of it, so the complete course notes, and just annotate it. Anyway, so what I did was that I bought one of those summary books, the A plus bio notes ones, and I went through and revised everything. So at every dot point, I referred back to this little summary book and read through it, tried to understand it. And I kind of realized you've got to explain everything because you're going to be explaining things to the examiner, right? So if you can't explain this concept here to your mother or your siblings or your dog or your wall or whatever, who, how are you gonna be able to explain it to the examiner? So I literally get my dog, my cat, and like sit them down in my room and just try and teach them photosynthesis. It doesn't matter that they're not like listening to you. It's about you verbalizing it and noticing the gaps in your knowledge. Cause you need to shut that book and like be able to explain the entire process from start to finish. Okay, because I think there's a lot of reliance on notes right now, especially right now. And I know like you guys are probably freaking out because the exam's a month away, but I was in the same boat as you, like when I was in year 11. So you've got time, but like literally you guys have just come to this revision lecture. Hopefully I've covered quite a bit of content and I've helped you out. But right now, what you should be doing is like straight up printing out the study design. Like if you have a printer with you right now, like print it out right now. And then you want to go through each dot point. Um, just use my ad unlimited account thing if you want here and get like a summary notes. If you've already got really good notes, don't even worry about it. But you need notes for every single topic. And I know you have a textbook, but I feel like the textbook's got too much extra info. So literally get a summary notes book somewhere. Either online or like, I prefer a physical one so I can draw my pictures on it and make mnemonics. So yeah, I would print the study design out, go through the summary book, annotate it, add my mnemonics, add my notes. If there was a topic I was struggling to remember, I'd try and come up with some stupid mnemonic, like a pirate ship with a mask for histamine, or a couple breaking up for stock codons, or something ridiculous that will like embed itself in my brain. Um, and so I would do that and try and explain it to my pets, or my mother, or my siblings, or the wall, or literally to myself, like a crazy person. Um, but that kind of helped me to explain it, and helped me know that I needed to explain it for the examiners. And so I did that and I was like, yes, I am so set for the exam. And then I printed out a study, like a full exam, and I got like 40%. So you want to have a foundation of knowledge, but you have to understand that your knowledge is not enough. The exam is conducted in such a way that your knowledge is not enough. You need to be able to apply your knowledge and answer VCAS questions as, as they want it to. Um, so what I did was I got my hands on like 20 exam papers. I did 20 biology exams. Um, I'll show you the list actually. I still have it on my phone. I'm nostalgic. Nostalgic? I just can't bring myself to delete it. Um, not a very good picture. You can't see that at all. 
you know, I'll just take a picture and just airdrop it. Why is it taking so long to airdrop? Okay, it's airdropping. Okay, it's not airdropping. Where is it going? Why is it not arriving? Okay, anyway, I did 20. So the exams I used were Vika, Quartz, Neap, ATAR notes, um, those A plus bio notes ones, STAV, checkpoints. I didn't really like checkpoints. I wouldn't really bother using it very much. But I just tried to find as many exams as I could. Um, there were also Northern Hemisphere exams. So many people don't know what that is, but I'll just try and show you in a second. So these are all the exams I used. And I did 20 of them. And I put them in my little to-do list and then just work through them. And I would do the multiple choice ones over breakfast. All the multiple choice questions over breakfast. And then I would do the short answer during like lunch time. Like I would eat my lunch at recess and I would just do the exams at lunch. Because I was like, I had a lot of extracurriculars going on. And I was working like two jobs <laughs> in high school. And I had like golf and piano and cross country and school captain. Like it was just a lot of stuff going on. Um. So yeah, I would try and organize my time like that. So Northern Hemisphere, they've got the same study design as you. They're just in like Indonesia or somewhere. And so they actually do their exams in June or July. And so you can have access to further exams here. And I know the study design is different now. So what you really want to do is make a note of all those particular topics which are different now. And so going to that FAQ doc is really useful because they outline all those new topics. But you can go to this website as well. And it gives you past papers as well for like Northern Hemisphere. You've got biology, Northern Hemisphere. <clears throat> so at least you've got three more papers here. And I know they're slightly different than study design, but yeah. So hopefully your teacher has some exams that she can give you, or he, or they can give you. Um, but yeah, like even for other subjects here, it's really useful. So if you're doing chemistry, you've got four extra exams here. I'm wondering if there's a PE one. Not physical. They don't have the PE one. Um, that's okay. But yeah, so check out this website for more exams. Use all the Vika ones, all the part like do like the last five years worth. I like I know that the past study design, some of them are a bit different. Um, but I think the last five years worth, most of it's pretty similar. You might have things such as the lack operon instead of trip operon, but similar principles anyway, and it's good knowledge. Um, and then pretty much I can't remember what else is cut out exactly, but a lot of it's just kind of leveled up knowledge. So it's kind of just knowing that you do have to be more aware of the trip operon or be more understanding of CAM, C3, C2 plants, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so prime, like I think doing 20 exams is a really good way to kind of not guarantee, but feel pretty safe in attaining a 40 plus study score. Because you're going to do it in time conditions as well, hopefully. So you'll get to like know the timings required. And also, um, what I would do is when I'm doing an exam, every time I was a bit unsure about a question, I'd make a note of it in my notebook. So I had my summary books and I'd annotate that with all my notes. Then I had a notebook and I would just write questions I was unsure of just as I was writing during my exam. Then I would correct my exam by myself using the Vika or whatever, you know, suggested answer guide. And I would make a note of every question I got wrong as well and add that to my notebook. And so I'd go back and I would put each of these questions onto the ATAR notes forum because I didn't have a tutor. And so I had like an anonymous name on the forum and I would just spam the forum with like, I'm not even joking, hundreds of questions. And people would reply within like 30 seconds because people want to help you, right? And it's completely free. So I would really, 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 really recommend making an ATAR notes account and going on the forums and just being completely anonymous if you want to and asking questions. So every question I was unsure about or got wrong, I would put that on the forum. And at the start, I was really shy because it feels like everyone is so smart in there, and they are. Um, when I'd be really like, oh my god, I'm so dumb. But they really helped me out, and I ended up getting a better grade than like, even the people who helped me sometimes, which, which sounds vain. But it's like, it just shows you that if someone is helping you, they can help you to just do even better than they did. So hopefully you guys can like get a 50 and beat my 49. Um, yeah, so do all those exams. Make a note of every question, correct the exam, put it in your notebook, put it on the forums, I didn't write that here, but put it on the forums, 
then make a note of whatever subject is whatever suggested answer, put it in your notebook, go back and research that particular topic. Like if you keep getting trip operon wrong, you've got a problem with the trip operon. You need to go back and study that. To study that, make a note of every single theory you just didn't understand or you got wrong or you're unsure about and read that every single night and review it and try and explain it to your dog or whatever. And then hopefully you can explain it to such a well, like, level, such a good level that you're feeling comfortable enough to actually address it on the exam. And the, like, if you keep doing practice questions, you're going to see they recycle the same type of questions every year. That natural selection formula I gave you, they use the same thing every year, same structure. Same with the L.A. Patrick stuff. They do that for, like, a lot of topics. So you really want to know that and just be on top of that. And, yeah, if you keep doing exams like that, keep making note of every question you're unsure of or got wrong and putting them into your notebook and reviewing it, you're going to kill the exam, honestly. You're going to get, like... 20 exams done, and then you're gonna walk in an exam day. Like, I walked into my bio exam and I was like excited for it because I had studied so hard for that. I'd gone from like not knowing what transcription was in September to like doing 20 whole practice exams and feeling really confident in my knowledge of biology that I could like explain it to anyone. And I, maybe I'm just a nerd, but I actually enjoyed the biology exam and I walked out of it feeling like, yes, I killed that. So you're gonna like walk in feeling really confident if you do that, I reckon. Um, Okay, that's enough of my tips, I think. I'm going to go through your questions now, because I know they're all a lot. Um, got 12 minutes. Even for the new study design, just do the current, like, the past study design questions and try and seek out some company ones too. But you really want to kind of use the VCAR format and kind of keep reviewing that FAQ doc. Uh, with memorizing inputs and outputs, um, I know numbers are hard. Flashcard them. Like, make physical flashcards, like, out of paper if you want. Or um, you could print out, like, or just... You know, draw out a full table and go glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, and trying to remember the inputs and outputs and just like filling in that table every day so you can memorize it. Just stuff like that. Or even just spending like 10 minutes reciting it or making up a song or something like that. Because memorizing numbers is really boring. Um, so I know it kind of sucks, but it really is just trying to fill out the table as many times as you can. It's really important to know specific definitions for key terms. You want to flashcard them. I don't think anyone suggested a good flashcard app. So the one that I use is on my iPad, I use GoodNotes. There's a beta version where you can make flashcards. Um, otherwise, I've been making physical flashcards for my bio students. Um, numbers. Yeah, flashcards. So I will have like genetic drift, changes in the frequency on the other side. And so I just keep, I could spend some template. I've been doing that for all my key terms for my students. And so just doing something like that, copying and pasting them from our slide deck that we just looked at today and doing that is a really good method. Look at that, unresolved security options. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm a sucker for flashcards. IgE antibodies cause mast cells to release too much histamine. Uh, you do need to know their different functions. You need to know about it just, just for IgE antibodies. So knowing that they have that cross-linking, um, the first response is kind of like cross-linking, and then afterwards, subsequently, you've got quite a large impact. So yeah, you do need to know a bit of background for that. I think it used to be bigger on the study design, and now it's not, but just knowing it anyway. Okay, there's a big shift toward 10-mark questions. Actually, by the way, you guys, write this down. Um, the 2019 chemistry exam, just write that down. Okay, on the 2019 chemistry exam, there was a big like 10-mark question on the biofuels, Go back and look at the 2019 exam. If you go to the examiner's report, scroll down to the very end. The last question is a big 10 mark question and it's about biofuels. And biofuels has just been introduced into the biology study design. And I think they'll ask you something very similar to what was on my chemistry exam in 2019. And so they're going to ask you to evaluate like pros and cons associated with it, how it works. And you don't need to know much the chemical structure or whatever, but it will be a lot of ethical based discussion on that chemistry exam. So yeah. With the 10 mark question, um, it's not really common, 10 marks, but they might do it now because they are linked to an essay type format. But firstly, you want to identify key points. So they will usually state in the stem some things you need to consider. So kind of brainstorm ideas associated with each of them. And then they mark these holistically. So it's not like a checklist. It's kind of like knowing that you've kind of covered everything broadly. So kind of having like 10 key points to discuss. So usually you want to consider pros and cons because it'll be quite an ethics-based question. Consider a scenario. What are the advantages and disadvantages? And you also want to have some address of the biology of the question too. So it might be an experiment and you have to talk about independent variable, dependent variable, what you're measuring, what's changed, errors, um, ethics, stuff like that. 
So really kind of identifying the broader picture, taking a step back, trying to think of 10 separate points and using dot points to answer it. Um, so consider the biology, pros, cons, anything else, so errors, evaluation, what to improve, stuff like that. Running out of time. Multiple choice questions, you should be able to get done within like five to 10 minutes. Because you're going to be doing 20 exams, right guys? You're gonna be practicing a lot. So you're gonna get them done really fast. And so you can definitely save time there because it is 120 minutes for the whole exam. So um, yeah, if you can save time at the multiple choice section, you're making time for else, which is good. I've discussed this, I've discussed this. Immunity is really big. So really walking through all your concepts. So kind of like making a mind map in your head. So what I would do is I'd go, okay, like I said before, I, I got scratched by my cat. What happens next? Okay, I might get infected, the pathogen gets in. What happens next? Macrophage eats it, presents it to T helper cell. T helper cell will activate B cell, also activate C toxic killer cell. B cell will make antibodies. Antibodies have what roles? What do antibodies do? How do they do this? What happens next? What is a vaccine? How does a vaccine work? And I try and like mind map all of that in my head. And it's really mentally fatiguing. It makes my brain so tired, but it helps you retain everything in your brain a lot better. So being able to do that in your brain and think everything through is like exhausting but it helped me to remember immunity and just kind of walking through all these scenarios. So like I teach PA as well and just kind of walking through everything in your head um, as you're like, I don't know, like when I'm running, I'll be walking through processes like respiration or whatever. I do the multiple choice ones first. I just do the exam in order. Any big question, I try and like, I make a note of it and try and answer it as best I can and then come back to it at the end. I did 20. Um, I started with, I think I did one VCAR paper at the start, like the 2016 one or something. And then I did a bunch of company papers and I saved the rest of the VCAR ones toward the end to try and get a really good grip of like the VCAR structure. Or I tried to like intersperse it, I think. Um, Cause you really want to get VCAR structure down cause they are the ones writing the exam. And I know it's a different study design, but it's fine. I started last minute revision like right now, like where you guys are right now. I attended one of the ATANET lectures, freaked out about my lack of knowledge and just learned everything. I'd also listened to that Ed Rollo dude, his podcast. Dachi's biology podcast. That was a really good podcast. Um, and then as I said, I printed out study design, went through, ticked off everything. Um, just do some exams and you'll see how much is on. That wasn't very useful, but yeah. I'm not really sure about diagrams. Um, you don't have to know any major ones. Do you know your structure of like mitochondria? So cytosol, matrix, cristae, stuff like that. Um, I'm not sure we draw restriction enzyme cuts in a gel electrophoresis, but on a plasmid, on a plasmid, you might have like a circular plasmid here and you want to insert a gene of interest, so you cut once here, right? And so you've got, got your plasmid cut and you've also got your gene of interest. So with your gene of interest, you cut it twice. You cut it there and there and it insert in there and then you'd ligate it. So I guess that's what you're asking. I hope that covers it. I'm not sure what a competitive ELISA is, but I guess it's probably to do with the, um, the proteins being competitive or like it wanting to bind. So I you probably have to spend a bit more time looking at that. I think I lost like 20 or 13 marks or something on my exam, like 13 to 20 marks on my exam and I overall got a 40. And I was getting like 100% in school, like I was rank one. But my school was a really, really tiny public school with like five people in the class. So don't spend too much time fretting about sacks and rankings and stuff because we don't really know how it works. Ethics, I really, really advise bookmarking that biology tab on your news app and just skimming them. Like skimming articles in Wired Magazine, The Atlantic, The Conversation, and just reading them. I know people don't really read a lot of news like that. I, I'm a scientific journalist as well, so I write articles like this, so I'm just interested in it. Um, but I think it's really important to just keep an open mind and like engage with the literature like that. And just reading like super chill articles about it, considering both sides is good. Um, natural killer cells target deviant cells in the bacteria. Mm. Deviant cells are cells which have been invaded. And I think it's more about, um, well, cytotoxic killer cells usually kill cells which are infected. It's kind of similar. So deviant cells are cells which have been infected and they're no longer like, behaving in a normal way. Uh, you won't really get any ethical investigations anymore. Well, I guess for your, um, they will give you a scenario like, I had some about algae and some plants in photosynthesis. And so you've got like, a structure for hypothesis, if, then, when. If we have three different sets of plants in these beakers, then this will happen when all conditions except insert independent variable are kept the same. So look up if, then, when format for hypothesis. And the research field will just be associated with it. I recommend both because 
We want to do some examples like associated with the current study design as well. And so we have ones, there are no more VCA ones for the new study design. I did, um, I really just kind of shoved everything about one and two out of the way for my three, four. So I just focused on Indonesian and biology. Um, I think I told you this, so really the whole thing. One week before the exam, I was still doing practice exams and I think three days before I just kind of stopped and I watched a movie the night before. I feel like I watched a really good movie. I don't remember it now. I always watch a movie before my exams. Kind of helps sort of like relax my brain and stop. Like the night before your exam, you should not be like full on cramming. You should be ready for it. There's no point like cramming the night before. So you want to like be as chill as possible. Oh, so I watched the David Adam documentary. That's what I did the night before. Um, I talked about one month before, one week. I was still kind of like revising, going through my notes, reviewing my little summary, my summary book each week, each night, as well as my notebook with all my mistakes in it. I'd revise that every night too, or every day. Um, I probably wouldn't use this. Yeah, technically carbon never reaches zero. Just like when you drop like a tennis ball, it never apparently stops moving ever. Supposedly, it's physics. I don't know what, uh, no, I would not do this. Don't don't use math terms instead of therefore. I know it sucks, but just getting into the grind of practicing will help you. I loved biology. I'm doing biomed right now, and I, I teach biology four years, and I work in a lab where I literally condense intense bio knowledge and make it accessible to other people. Like, I'm like a head of social media for this company. We just, like, simplify bio stuff. And I'm a scientific journalist, so clearly I kind of adore biology. Um, just know your basic block mutations. I have a, a mnemonic, did it, D-I-D-I-T, duplication, insertion, a duplication, um, inversion, translocation, remember them. Holes, I don't know, just really look up this. I don't think you need to know too much about it. ELISA is new now, the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, you have to know about it. Look at that FAQ doc. Um, sympatric can be due to reproductive isolation, but can also be due to Actually, yeah, it is mostly reproductive isolation. Biofuels are fuels made of like, um, like you, you, if you work in a fish and chip shop, they have like these huge vats, vats of fat afterward. You can use that to make biofuels, like diesel or whatever instead. Um, it's a more sustainable fuel source as opposed to like fossil fuels. Sympatric speciation is important. I'd recommend writing it down and looking it up. And if you do print out the whole study design, you'll see that it's there and you have to memorize it and learn about it anyway. Types of fossils are also important, so like trace fossil, biosignatures, um, ma, what do you call it? Cast fossils, you need to know all of them. How the new fossils change interpretation of us? I'm not sure what this means, but it's really um, new fossils kind of throw into array a whole entire definition of species. The main ones I've listed here, also just check the study design. A bicondylar angle, maybe? This is like the, your legs are kind of pushed inward, the anime girl legs. Um, what my friend calls it's just it's conducive to a bipedalism because other species are more flat legged whereas we're more pushed inward like that. Uh, I'm not sure about adaptations really. Um, but if you're talking about bipedalism, you have to know a lot about bipedalism. Okay, I talked about this a bit, so hopefully that made sense with the monoclonal antibodies. I was stressed in September because I realized I knew nothing and I just studied so hard and I literally thought I'd get a 43 and I didn't. I got a 49. So. Um, email me if you've got questions. Well, we're like, like at the end now, so I'm going to go through as much as I can. I, I don't know how much you need to know about ELISA exactly because I didn't spend too much time on it here, but go to that FAQ doc because they do talk about it. There's hairpin structure for both low and high, but the high levels of Japan is a, a faster hairpin where the ribosome falls off. This one taking a step back, considering all factors like variables, independent, dependent, constant, and then ethical errors and er like other errors other ethical considerations and errors is important. Um, just know a bit of it. So just look up pro differences between normal pathway and protein security pathway. And ELISA is immuno enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, which is a method of detecting presence of antigens. So we've got quite a few questions left. Okay, we've got a lot of questions left. You guys, we're at the end. Um, please send your questions to my email if you have any more. It's angelica at Pizzamont.com. I am kind of slammed with like school and work and I just finished my interviews and stuff recently and I've got a marathon on Sunday so I'm a bit busy right now but I'll try my best to answer like as soon as I can. Um, thank you for coming today. I hope I helped you out. I know I talked really really fast and we went through an insane amount of content but hopefully I helped you understand some stuff a bit better and also the slide should help you so really you can copy and paste a lot of stuff I've written there and make flashcards and it's a really good revision tool anyways. Um, it looks like we've got 66 questions left unread. 
Um, yeah, so if you have any questions left, send me an email. Good luck. Happy studying. I was literally in the same spot as you like four years ago, so I completely understand how you're feeling about the exams. But well done for coming to this. That was two and a half hours of school while you're on holidays. So, yeah, you guys should be in good stead for the exam. And you've still got so much time, so... Yeah, good luck with it. I hope I helped you out. Um, yeah. Happy studying. I'm not sure if I should wait or go. There are still questions being put in. Um, yeah, if you have a burning question, I think I put my email on the slide somewhere. Just got other confirmations. Yes, lucky cat will pass your exams for you. There you go. That may be removed in the actual slides, I'm not sure. But write it down now, I guess. Cool. I reckon that's the end of it, so good luck you guys. Um I'm trying to think anything else I want to know. You'll get the slides emailed to you. You'll have access to the recording later as well. So probably by the end of the week. Otherwise, you can just send me an email and I'll try and send it through to you. Um, yeah, do as many exams as you can. Keep note of all your mistakes and errors and unsure or uncertainties. And review that consistently and try and explain everything to your parents or your pets or whomever. Um, and yeah, you've got this. So good luck. Bye, guys. Where is my... Um, <laughs> I need to stop streaming.